Um, so people, welcome to the Exploring Climate Solutions webinar series. This series is brought to you by the Governor's Council on Climate Change. On April 22nd, 2015, Governor Malloy uh, uh, issued an executive order creating the Governor's Council on Climate Change, also known as the GC3. The Council is charged with examining the efficacy of existing policies and regulations designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and identify new strategies to meet the state's greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. The Council is composed of 15 members from state agencies, quasi-state agencies, businesses, and nonprofits. To learn more about the GC3, please go to www.ct.gov slash DEEP slash GC3. The webinar series explores innovative and successful climate change solutions in Connecticut and around the nation. This series provides firsthand accounts of high-profile municipal climate programs, climate initiatives in the corporate world, new greenhouse gas reporting frameworks, statewide sustainability programs, low carbon fuel initiatives, and other programs and projects that help reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve climate resilience. So I'm excited uh, to have Sarah Bronin, Chair of the Climate Stewardship Council for the City of Hartford, and Shuba, Shubhada Kambli, uh, Sustainability Coordinator for the City. Um, Sarah and Shubhada will be presenting the City's Climate Action Plan, which was recently released um, by the Hartford Climate, Climate Stewardship Council in partnership with the Mayor's Sustainability Office. The presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. If you have a question, please submit it uh, through the question uh, dialog box, and we'll read it aloud for Sarah and Shubhada to respond to. Before we get started, for those of you uh, listening via your computer speakers, uh, if you're experiencing poor sound quality, I do encourage you to call in using a land telephone line. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sarah and Shubhada. Thank you again for your willingness to present today, and uh, I'm excited to hear more about the, the City of Hartford's Climate Action Plan. Thanks, Carrie, and um, thanks for everybody for listening in. Uh, this is Sarah um, Bronin, and Shubhada is, is there too, I think. I am, hi everybody. And uh, Shubhada plays a formal role as a city staff person um, for this initiative, entirely grant funded. Um, her office consists of three people, and I'm the volunteer um, who started with the, through the City Planning and Zoning Commission um, trying to build on what we have done in the zoning code um, uh, to, to bring environmental uh, issues to the fore um, in other ways outside of zoning. And so we're just going to go through a few uh, slides and then we're going to actually uh, kick over from this presentation to the Climate Action Plan itself, which is imminently being posted to our website. We just adopted it yesterday. Um, so you'll see, you can see a draft there now, but the final version will be posted hopefully sometime later today. Um, but let's go through just a few of the slides, and I'm going to start with the why, and then Shubhada is going to take us through the who, the mission, and the values, and then I'll come back in and talk about process and um, the focus areas, which are six uh, focus areas that we decided to, to work on. Um, so why did we decide to um, deal with climate change here in Hartford? Uh, well, here you see a picture of Hartford. For those of you who haven't been there, that's Bushnell Park. You can see the state capitol. Um, we're a diverse city. We're a, uh, a thriving city despite maybe some uh, municipal finance challenges that somebody else gets to deal with. Um, but we actually have a lot of green space, a lot of um, great amenities, which we'll talk about uh, later on in this presentation, that we could really build from. We also, you know, despite what you know, some might have us believe, we also believe that climate change is real. And here's that same image um, of Bushnell Park, well, not necessarily from the aerial, but from the ground, when we had um, one of our various freak snowstorms that pummeled us with uh, extreme weather and snow and extreme participation precipitation. In Hartford, we also have some added challenges of, um, how, of dealing with uh, extreme heat. We've seen more high heat days than uh, we've ever seen before. Um, we also have the challenge of, of flooding. Um, our dikes are in, in pretty poor shape, so we uh, are concerned with all of these issues which are tied to extreme weather, which again is tied to climate change. We actually, as I mentioned before, um, started this effort as an outgrowth of uh, a citywide 
uh, recodification of our zoning regulations, which took place uh, in early January 2016. And what we realized through the process of revising our zoning regulations was that there were a lot of people all over Hartford who were really passionate about and interested in the environment. And not just the environment for its own sake, but in using the environment as a tool to improve quality of life, to give us um, to, to provide economic benefits and to improve our health. And the way that we drafted the zoning regulations, which is probably a whole other presentation, but it really was intended to um, build these quality of life issues into um, parcel by parcel zoning decisions that might have been made. Uh, we've won a lot of awards, so there's some awards that we got um, state, statewide. We're, um, very, very proud of those because we won the awards not just for its environmental features but also for the way it, uh, the code catalyzes economic development. But that kind of explains, you know, why do we start thinking about this? Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Shubhita who will talk about, you know, who got together to start this conversation. Um, and here's a picture of one of our early Climate Stewardship Council meetings and I'll, I'll hand it over from here. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, the Climate Stewardship Council was formed by Mayor Bronin in partnership with a series of different community stakeholders. Uh, the CSC is affiliated with the City's Planning and Zoning Commission, as well as um, a, a number of different organizations. We have uh, 34 members who represent neighborhood revitalization zones, city departments, area nonprofits, local businesses, five different city commissions, and state and federal agencies as well. The Climate Stewardship Council's charge was initially to develop and formalize our city's climate action plan. Um, and as was mentioned previously, the plan was just approved yesterday by the council and will go to the Planning and Zoning Commission for review later this month. So that was a huge milestone for us. The plan also frames the work of our brand new sustainability office, which is 100% grant funded and is part of the mayor's office as well. As sustainability coordinator, I lead a very small team of three people. And my team includes a green infrastructure specialist and assistant who are focused on ways to improve stormwater management through natural techniques across our city. We're incredibly excited for this work and for the generous support of three funders, including Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, Partners for Places, and UConn's Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation. In terms of our mission, uh, next slide, please. Our mission is clear. We will use environmental work as a vehicle for achieving quality of life gains for our residents and concrete financial health and equity improvements. That's incredibly important to us. For us, our mission is reflected in values and projects that are deeply tied to clean air, clean water, food security, flooding prevention, that's a very timely topic right now, green jobs, and neighborhood quality of life as well. When we're talking about our values, we're talking about, for example, reciting a waste incinerator to reduce air pollution and chronic disease, preventing catastrophic flooding, or promoting the basics like planning practices that improve bike safety and connections that allow our bikers to get safely and efficiently to and from work. We're evaluating a series of different ways in which we can productively affect the well-being of people in our city. We're also looking closely at and prioritizing the projects that have the biggest environmental, financial, and social gains for our residents. So for example, what initiatives create the greatest number of green jobs that can be sustained over time? How do we support those businesses that are doing the right thing by local employees and the environment? How do we keep our neighbors safe in the face of increasingly severe storms? Some of the other areas that we're focused on including, include, for example, reducing electricity costs. We have among the highest costs in the continental United States. We're also evaluating ways to create better walking paths, bikeways, and public transportation to offer safe, affordable connections to jobs, recreation, and services. As part of our uh, work in the city and with uh, staff members across the city, we're also looking at ways to ensure that Hartford residents who lack access to adequate heat or air conditioning in their homes 
also have access to shelters and emergency facilities during flooding, excess snow and ice and heat waves. We want to protect our most vulnerable residents. Sarah, with that, I will turn it over to you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Shubhita. So just as a brief, you know, word about how we got to the point where we are now, Shubhita described who's been involved, what drove the, the group, um, uh, the values of the group, which we agreed upon at our very first meeting, I should say, because uh, we all, you, you can come to these issues in a, in a variety of ways. And for us in Hartford, it was important that all of these different groups that had come together, the business groups, the nonprofit groups, neighborhood representatives, um, the city commissions that had been formally appointed by uh, the mayor and the city council, you know, everybody has a different interest. And so deciding on those shared values was really important. After getting that, um, you know, consensus around those shared values, we started, getting input about what a climate plan could look like. And we started off, um, we really started before, we started meeting in April of 2016. We met on a basically a monthly basis and um, in September we really started the planning process in earnest. The first few meetings were to help us to get to know each other, even though we had been, often had been working in the same space, we, not everybody in the room knew each other and, and that was actually one of the challenges and something you might be finding in your own towns, is that you have people that are doing very similar, potentially complementary work, and, and they may not even know um, know each other. So, so we spent the first few months doing that. But then, in the fall of 2016, we, about a year ago, we started the planning process in earnest. Um, we had uh, there's a list at the bottom of the institutions, and there's actually more: UConn Law, UConn Business, UConn Undergrad, Trinity College, um, a team from UC Berkeley. Uh, Climate Corps fellow through the Environmental Defense Fund program. Uh, we had a variety of interns who helped get us off the ground that fall and throughout the process, um, doing research, trying to identify best practices in the areas we were interested in, um, drafting memos, helping with uh, the website, kind of putting all of these pieces together. Um, through the fall, we worked on what we would call, what we now referred to as the research basis for the climate plan. And a lot of that, again, was done by students who were tasked with um, going out and finding all of the different reports that have ever been written on, <laughs> on topics um, related to the environment in Hartford, all of the resources that were available, all of the programs that we might um, be able to uh, work with. And they pulled all of that together into a really long, I think probably if you put it all together, 500 footnote document um, that formed the research basis for our plan. Maybe not 500, maybe 100, I don't know. There was a lot of them. Um, but we used that research basis as a discussion point throughout the fall and winter and um, used it as a starting off point for a conference that was held at UConn Law School, so I should probably say I'm a professor at UConn Law School, so we, um, we do topics on, um, I run our Center for Energy and Environmental Law, and we do topics, uh, conferences on topics, on a variety of topics, and this year, um, to kind of build on what the City of Hartford was doing, we did a topic, on, a conference on municipal climate resilience, which I think probably some of you guys uh, attended. And we had experts from LA, from uh, New York City, from um, Portland, from a variety of leading towns uh, who have grappled with these issues and grappled with climate action planning processes. So that happened in March and we had focus groups uh, focused on each of the areas in, that we'd identified in our plan um, using the student's initial report as the kind of jumping off point. Um, then we decided to refine this um, framework went through a process of presenting the concept of the plan to the public, went through the process of doing, um, dra drafting a, a, a more public facing plan, not a, not a hugely footnote burdened plan, but one that was really drew from that effort, um, but was more uh, better for the public to digest um, and, and understand and relate to. Um, and then we went through the summer, did a couple of iterations of that, and then we adopted the plan yesterday. So that, that's a long explanation of our planning process. And here are the areas that we decided to focus on early on. Uh, energy, and I should say landscape really, because we, we 
sort of change the name from green space to landscape in general. Um, food, transportation, waste, and water. And I'll go through how we, what are the sort of some of the key issues we have thought about before in Hartford, some of our successes, and then we'll, we'll check out the climate action plan and how this all fit together into an actual document because I think that's probably what some of you are interested in seeing. And I should say that um, Shubita started with the city in, I think, May, is that right? Yeah, May, of two, right. May, two, May 2017, and so a lot of this effort was done by volunteers, by commissioners, by students. So for those of you who are looking and saying, oh, we could never do this, Hartford's this huge city that has all these resources. Well, actually, a lot of the, the, the support for this effort had been done um, you know, and before we had a formal city staff and, and Shubin has been able to step right in and, and help complete the process and, you know, now is taking the planning to implementation. But in terms of the drafting of the plan, one of the key things we found is having enthusiastic volunteers combined with the students, um, harnessing their energy. I mean, that really went a long way to, um, to helping us uh, get to the point where we were when we were, um, when we were so graced to have Shubin to join the effort. So great to have her. Um, so in the energy space, so Hartford um, actually has done a big push on, on solar. Um, we've gotten a Soul Smart Gold designation. We've removed barriers to solar. We, we're lo really seeing solar as a way. We're trying to advocate for shared solar, which um, if you want more information on that, that's a, a really important issue to a lot of towns, but especially places like Hartford where people may not be able to afford their own solar on their roof, um, so sharing it is the best option. We started an energy improvement district. Um, in fact, the first meeting is today, right after this call. Um, we have uh, the first, in, in the first round of state microgrid funding, uh, we developed a public-private microgrid that's powered by a fuel cell. We've gotten, again, state support and assistance for energy efficiency programs, also Eversource, um, is helping with that, um, and we've zoned for renewables. So in the zoning code, we now have places all over the city that can be used for solar and wind. So this is the foundation, the regulatory foundation, the project-based foundation, the advocacy-based foundation that we build on when we set our goals in the area of energy, and we'll see those goals when we look at the climate plan. In the area of food, you know, it might be surprising to know that Hartford has one of the oldest food commissions in the country, the Food Policy Advisory Commission. And that is a multidisciplinary, uh, very robust commission that, that tries to push the city forward in terms of food policy. We have farmers markets, we have community gardens. Our zoning code um, has been, that was recently, again, adopted in 2016, allows for urban agriculture uh, pretty much everywhere in the city. In terms of landscape, for those of you who have been to Hartford, you probably know that we have some of the most magnificent parks in the state, um, a network of parks designed by um, Jacob Wiedemann, uh, the Olmsted brothers, uh, and newer parks like the Riverfront Park, which have um, also added to our connection with, with nature. We've been fortunate to um, hopefully to be announced more publicly soon, but get National Park Service technical assistance for connecting those parks better. Um, we have a very strong tree ordinance that helps us protect trees, a city forester that really takes our obligations under the, um, under the state statutes very seriously, and, and um, it, which is a good thing for Hartford because we're a city with not enough trees, and so we have to protect the ones we have. And, and one of the goals in our, in our planning process, as you'll see, is that we, we plant more trees and enhance the urban tree canopy. But again, this is just to say we're building on a foundation of a lot of disparate things that were happening that now that we can sort of assemble them and say them all together, we really have um, a basis to build on the stewardship uh, of green spaces. In the area of transportation, those of you who have been sitting in traffic in I-84 and 91 uh, probably know that we're really at the center um, of two major highways and uh, several regional uh, transportation systems. The bus system, the, the Connecticut Transit, as well as the regional Connecticut fast track system. We have four uh, fixed, uh, fully built out train stations here with uh, connections going now to uh, Yukon eastward um, and, of course, westward uh, out to New Britain. But we've also had, so you, you probably know about those things, but we have 
uh, growing infrastructure for electric vehicles. We have a very, very robust, and I should, oh, I should do this little slide here, so that is Theodore Roosevelt in an electric vehicle that was made here in Hartford uh, back in the early 20th century. But in addition to the car-based uh, transportation sort of features that we, that we have, we also have a very robust bicycling community. So on the top left you see uh, one of our city planners holding up the bike-friendly community bronze designation that we received last year. Um, and also we have a walking program and a walking advocacy focused on uh, the downtown cultural assets but called the iQuilt Plan, which has also raised awareness and, and, and engaged in pretty important planning efforts in the city. So in terms of transportation, what we see in Hartford is really existing fabric, existing initiatives to have a multimodal transportation system that addresses affordability and accessibility. And then there's the last two areas, the, the, the second to last is waste. And you might think, okay, again, we, what is Hartford known for? Well, we're, what we're really known for, Schubert mentioned it, is having, being the site, of, in terms of the area of waste, is being the site of the landfill on I-91, and then being the site in the South Meadows uh, of the trash to energy plant. But we're trying to transform not only the perception of Hartford as a hub for dirty trash, but, but also you know, make ourselves responsible for um, new initiatives that will get unnecessary trash out of the waste stream, do things like composting, raising awareness through a, a recycled fashion goods uh, show called Trash and Fashion, but also combining that with large infrastructure projects like capping the landfill and putting a one megawatt solar array on it. I think the largest municipal um, uh, landfill covering solar array in the state. So we have a composting culture that's developed. We have a few organizations that do that. In the top right, you see Blue Earth Compost, um, who is now starting a recycling, a composting uh, program at Billings Forge, which is where Firebox and the kitchen uh, are located. Um, and that is going pretty well from what I understand. But again, it's about changing the culture of, uh, of the perception of the city as being a center for, for wasteful activities and trying to make us into something something different. As for water, we actually have two rivers or riverways running through the city. So the first is the Connecticut River, which forms the eastern boundary of the city. The second is uh, the north and south branches of the Park River, which are, um, the Park River is, is, is underground in some places, but the north branch uh, has been the scene of uh, collaborative effort with DEEP to uh, develop planning processes, manage the urban watershed there. Um, we're looking to for some cooperation from towns upstream, including Bloomfield and other towns, to try to make sure that that area is is clean and, and turns to an, from a waterway that can't support uh, water life to one that potentially at some future point can. Um, we also, in addition, and there's a riverfront trail on, on the Connecticut River that's being uh, built. We just received funding for that that will be built almost up to the city line and almost connecting to Windsor, which of course the trail has a lot of benefits um, for city residents, for region, for the region, um, for bikers, for walkers, um, we think it will be a great amenity. But in addition to beautifying the trails and things like that, we've had, as Shubita mentioned, a very robust effort in green infrastructure. Uh, we received funding to, to develop green infrastructure program here. Um, we've had a great assistance from the MDC. It, it had a, rare, a rain barrel initiative which uh, provided rain barrels to uh, residents. Um, and also through zoning, we're promoting private development um, that, that is attuned to uh, stormwater management needs. So we've uh, put buffers on waterways, uh, we've incentivized green roofs, we've just recently at our last meeting uh, actually required uh, private property owners to manage one inch of stormwater on site or opt out of it um, by paying into a fund or by um, doing it off site. So that's pretty innovative. I think, and we're happy to talk more about any of these individual strategies. But, but kind of getting a little bit into the weeds here on this, I think was was really meant to say, these are the six areas that we that we are building from a pretty good base when we look at our climate action plan, and that's where we'll turn to next. Um, so, just to give you a sense of the plan, let me see if I can just 
go to enter full screen. Just going, just wanted to give you a few image, images of the plan itself before opening it up to some questions. And Shubita, feel free to interrupt too, um, as we just go through a few a few of the pages. This is the climate action plan itself is about 80 pages uh, long. We started with a photo that um, you know was meant to just evoke what the climate action plan was was about. This happened to take place at Envision Fest, um, and it was really a broader question of what is your vision for Hartford. But as Shubert mentioned, you know our shared vision for Hartford is really a cleaner, greener, healthier, more economically sustainable place. And you see some of that you know articulated in in this um, uh, you know in the writing on this wall here. But the the planning process is really meant to be okay. Where could Hartford go from here? If you look at the contents of the Climate Action Plan, again, for those interested in the, the nitty-gritty of how a plan might be drafted, we started off with an introductory section, I'll use my arrow here, that really explains what, why do we care about climate in Hartford? You think Hartford is just a, you know, it, 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 what are we worried about up here? We don't have hurricanes. We don't have earthquakes. So what, what are we worried about? Well, we're really worried about three things. Um, Warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers, and extreme flooding. And we'll get to those um, some pages on that. Again, just as a preview, not to actually read through them. Um, we also wanted to explain what the planning and engagement process was, and so those two things are what's folded into the introduction. Then we wanted to have a statement of our values. Again, even before we talked about specific goals, you know, what do these values uh, require us to think about when we're thinking about the the, the planning process? And then we get into our goals, which talks about, um, we explain the terminology that we use, we summarize the vision in each of the areas, and then we w go through each of the areas and talk about successes. Um, we talk about, you know, f we, it, for each of them we have five, five, um, strat five sub goals or five, uh, and then within, that, within each of those we have strategies. Um, we do some acknowledgments and then we compile really a fraction of the resources that um, the students and others have found over time. Shiva, did you have anything to add about the, the contents while we're in this no, slide? No, I think that covers it. I think that covers it. Thanks, sir. So we had a couple, these are pages that we usually be seen side by side. So we have a, a note from the mayor just to emphasize that we're, you know, working in an environment here that is supported not by, not just by advocates, you know, we really have the mayor on board and the city council, three city council members um, uh, participated in the climate council at various points and, and their involvement has been critical to passing some of the things, to, to adopting some of the changes, um, both going backward and going forward. And I should say that as part of our meeting process during those first few months, since we didn't have a plan together, what we the other thing that we did during those first few months, in addition to, get to getting to know each other back in um, spring and summer of last year, was develop a few policy proposals as kind of test balloons to see if the city council would be interested in, in adopting them. And they, and they did adopt them. And so two examples, one was the energy improvement district that went through um, the, the Climate Stewardship Council. We vetted it, we revised it, we gave them a draft ordinance, and, and the city council looked at it and said, okay, we think this is a good idea, and so they, they passed it. The other thing that we um, passed was a complete streets policy. And a complete streets policy is a policy that prioritizes bikers and walkers to the same extent that, that we prioritize drivers. So just using those two policy proposals as an example, even if you don't have the resources to make a large scale plan like we did, uh, you know, you might have the ability to get some folks together to advocate from all sides for something that's good, that's good for everybody. So in our introduction here, this is a picture from the Keeney Park Sustainability Project with Yard Goats, by the way, and their, their organization. Um, we had an initial statement about, you know, again, why, why do we care about climate change? Well, we start off with a statement that climate change affects each and every one of us and, you know, explain how the plan is set out. Then we get into the three climate change impacts. We have you know, a couple of pretty easy to understand graphics combined with a photo. I love this photo. Um, it's a photo of uh, a gentleman from Nepal, a village elder who came to visit the Hartford Green Tech Academy, which had built uh, uh, wind uh, and solar systems and 
packaged them and sent them out to Nepal and the village had installed them and so he was coming to Hartford to thank them. And this is the kind of thing that, that I don't think any, I didn't even know about this before we did the plan, but it was happening in our community through existing organizations. So if nothing else, the climate action planning process highlighted for everybody, you know, that, that there were a lot of people working on this issue, even people that, you know, schools and, and, you know, other places that you might not expect. So again, here we talk about warmer, wetter winters, trends um, in, in hotter, drier summers, heat days. We have a lot, a lot of high heat days and we're projected to get more according to the chart. Extreme flooding, our riverfront regularly floods and it's designed to do that. There's Mortenson Riverfront Plaza. But in the picture, if you look at the map at the top right, the flooding that um, occurs as a result of increased precipitation has the potential to flood all of those red areas, which includes downtown and at least 25% of the grand list. So this is obviously troubling. When we documented our planning and engagement, we also looked at, okay, we, we've done planning processes really starting in 2010, our comprehensive plan of development that called for us to have a greener, more sustainable Hartford. So when we put it all together, again, you know, one of the benefits of this process is that we actually pulled stuff together that showed that we have been interested in this issue for some time. And I think you'll find in your communities too that if, when you're going through this, you might ask yourself, have we ever done a planning effort that, that has said this before? And you might be as surprised as we were to find that actually we have done a lot in this. So we had our uh, One City, One Plan. We had the North Branch Park River Watershed Management Plan. We have an advisory commission on the environment that held an environmental summit in 2012. Um, we committed to being a clean energy community. Many of uh, the com folks on this call probably have uh, live in communities or work in communities that have done that. Um, we had a specific plan for the Northeast Neighborhood Sustainability, a parks guide done in 2004 for the, uh, that really tried to establish, sorry, 2014, um, a plan for interconnecting our parks. We had a, a clean energy task force that, that operated and existed for some time and then and sort of uh, went dormant but then was revived through the Climate Stewardship Council. Regionally, too, we've had um, got the Capital Region Council of Governments is our regional government, and they've set forth an agenda for sustainability. And of course, the Planning Commission code that I mentioned. The next two pages really start by describing the process that I've already described to you. So we convened, we had students work, we started a website, we did a concept draft, we have a Twitter account, we presented the plan, and here's one of our members, Tom Swar, presenting to Hartford 2000, which is a, a, an assembly group, there you are, Shubita, an assembly group of our NRZs. Um, we had that conference at UConn Law School, well attended, uh, solarized workshops, we hired Shubita. Um, uh, Luke did a town hall on environmental issues uh, over the summer to, to highlight features of the plan and to get public input. And you can see just by the photo, these, these are well attended, people really care. And now we have our celebratory photo of adopting the plan. So I'll, I'll breeze through the rest of this. You know, these are the section on values. That's the uh, March for Science that took place in Hartford um, a few months ago. Of course, public health is an important value. Economic development, these are students at AI Prince Tech who actually built a solar powered house in the school's courtyard. Social equity, so making sure that what we, um, what, anything we do in the climate plan affects persons of all interests. This is uh, Vecinos Unidos who is celebrating, among other things, community and recycling. Uh, then we get into our goals. And again, just an introductory page that talks about our six interconnected action areas, reemphasizing the shared values, describing terminology, so an action area is the six areas, the goals are the results within each action area, the strategies are specific actions we think will help us achieve our goals. And here is the summary of in each of the action areas what we want to achieve. So an energy, cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy, food, nutritious food that is locally grown or non-carbon intensive and is readily available, landscapes filled with trees and meadows that provide ecosystem services, transportation, multimodal affordable transportation network with safe biking and walking options, 
which improves air quality and cuts asthma rates, waste, eradication of the worst trash and blight, public education that boosts diversion, recycling, and reuse rates, and finally water, which we want to use more efficiently. We want to deal with both floods and droughts, and we want to make sure that green infrastructure um, helps to manage our stormwater. Within each of these areas, we started off with an introductory statement about what needs to be done. So this is action area A. Um, this is a team with Eversource uh, and the Youth Service Corps, which was started um, by the mayor, and they focus actually a lot on um, environmental issues in their in their work. Here, they, they, these Youth Service Corps members went door to door and informed people about a light bulb swap that was sponsored by the EPA and Eversource. So that's a, a fun picture of that at the Maple Avenue Senior Center. We did a page about what we've done together, and again, this is something. That Sarah, did we lose you? Shibadar, are you on? I am, yes. I think we might have lost Sarah. <laughs> um, pardon us for the technical difficulties. I'll just uh, shoot her a note, let her know that we cannot hear her. just briefly mention some of the work that we're doing on the energy and energy efficiency side. Um, we've been, uh, as part of the sustainability office, we've been working really closely with colleagues at uh, DPW and the rest of the city as well and taking a phased approach to energy conservation measures and public facilities and um, finishing up benchmarking actually of our most energy intensive buildings with the help of the Institute for Sustainability, uh, Sustainable Energy rather, at Eastern Connecticut State University. Uh, for uh, folks that are, who are unfamiliar with benchmarking, that means evaluating energy use and comparing that use to similar buildings across the country. It actually looks like a few of our schools might be in line for national recognition because of their energy efficiency, so we're uh, very excited about that as well. Um, we're also undergoing a $5 million streetlight retrofit with the help of DEET and grateful for that support and also closing in on cost savings of approximately $1 million. Uh, with two different renewable energy credit efforts and assistance from Connecticut Green Bank and Eversource as well. We are um, very lucky, and I've uh, sort of alluded to this, to have a multidisciplinary team including engineering, finance, purchasing, legal, and procurement as well to evaluate our new energy opportunities. So as you can tell, we're, we have zoned in or honed in on energy projects specifically as an area where we can affect the greatest uh, cost savings, environmental benefits, and benefits for our residents as well. Sarah, are you back on the line? No, not I'm not hearing back from her, but it looks like the slides are advancing. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we have uh, made uh, quite a lot of progress in terms of the energy resilience. Sarah had mentioned a microgrid, a fuel cell microgrid in our Parkville neighborhood, which we had been able to install um, with partners uh, such as Constellation and Bloom Energy. We just cut the ribbon on that fuel cell microgrid. And what it does is it powers a number of facilities in that area, including a school, a senior center, the health center, and a library as well. And, and this is very important in times of power outages, it can also power the local gas station and C-Town uh, grocery store. So that dramatically improves our neighborhood resiliency during outages. Uh, that was also a project that was supported by DEEP. So we've been fortunate to have that state level support there as well. Um, We uh, have had a number of successes in a variety of areas, including energy, and it looks like we're advancing to food as well. 
been really uh, looking to support the cultivation of local food and ensuring that our residents have access to healthy food sources as well through community gardens. We have more than 20 community gardens and a series of organizations that have been doing excellent work um, in this area. I'm just trying to make sure that Sarah's not muted. Um, if you could just keep going while I try to figure out what the technical difficulty is, that would be great. Okay, sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so in terms of some of our goals for local food production, really looking at ways to activate blighted property and make it suitable for urban agriculture, ensuring that the soil quality is good. Um, we're also assessing uh, ways to ensure that we're able to potentially create a food foraging forests by planting fruit and nut trees uh, and supporting those incubator commercial kitchens. Sarah, are you back on? Oh, sorry. I thought I was on mute. Uh, I'm just telling her to call back in. Okay. Uh, and so supporting the efforts of our local incubators that um, are uh, able to uh, support the local catering companies as well. Um, so, you know, we are evaluating those different opportunities that might be on the commercial side, might also be a little bit more grassroots. Other ways that we're looking to ensure access to healthy food include uh, potentially advocating for a regional food market to fill some of those gaps that may not be uh, filled right now by the farmers markets, for example. We'd also like to make sure that our farmers markets are able to offer SNAP benefits and other ways to reach out to all of our residents. And, uh, and offer that uh, food that's healthy and nutritious for all of our families in the area. We also know that we have a series of food deserts in our neighborhoods and uh, ensuring that we have grocery stores in the right places is also incredibly important for us. Diverting food from the waste stream is incredibly critical to uh, divert some of that food that actually is edible and is high quality. Uh, so redistributing some of that food and making sure it gets to the right households is important for us and for our stakeholders as well. Can you hear me? Yes, there we go. Okay. We'll get a little bit of feedback. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I just was on multiple lines. Sorry about that. Um, so thanks, Jupiter, for, again, picking up where we left off. Um, but I think Shubhita has really summarized the main issues in the area of food. One of the things that we got recommended by um, the city of Portland was that we needed to actually focus on carbon intensity of food. When they came to that conference, they said, we'll focus on this early on, and that this is something that we need to, to that is something that we recognize that we needed to do later. And so it's something that we incorporated to this one. In each of the five areas, we have resiliency as a main goal. And I, I know we're getting short on time, so uh, we'll kind of just go through the cover pages for each of the following. So in the area of landscape, you can see the goals at the bottom, improving tree canopy coverage, promoting meadows and native wildflower fields, improving public park facilities, enhancing human-made landscapes, and again, increasing resiliency. We follow the same format, what we've done together, explanation of our goals, what can you do, and we have featured uh, different individuals and businesses in the community. In action area D, uh, our goals are pretty straightforward too, increasing walking and biking and transit use, decreasing emissions from vehicles and making streets safer. What we've done together, the complete streets policy, the fast track system, zoning for bikes, bike education, all of these things we're really, really proud of. The area of waste, uh, we went through some of these issues too. We just did a fracking ban, as you see in the top middle there, uh, through zoning. Diversion, recycling and reuse in both the public and private sectors. Eradicating light and, bl and blight and litter, <laughs> or litter and blight, say that 10 times. Um, 
and increasing resiliency of waste facilities. And finally, in the area of water, reducing discharge into sewers and waterways. This is a big deal for a town like Hartford, which has so much of its land paved over. Enhancing waterway trails, improving water efficiency. Bottom left here is the water bubbler at the Hartford Marathon. I don't know if any of you run the marathon have seen that, but that's a really efficient way to provide water, uh, reducing plastic bag usage. And we're, we're glad that they're such a great environmental partner when they come to our town. Um, managing flood risks, another image of the Connecticut River flooding, and improving water infrastructure resiliency. So that kind of sums up what we've done. Um, this is our acknowledgments, and every single person listed here and more has worked on or uh, been involved with the plan. Again, DEEP has been a major partner, and here's our resources page. So I think we should open it up to questions, Carrie, and again, apologies for getting, I don't even know what happened, uh, dropped off and then struggling to get back on. But um, I think we should open up to questions if you're amenable to that. Great, yeah, perfect. Thank you to you both, and thank you for rolling through the technical difficulties. That was, you know, kudos to both of you for the smooth transition back and forth there. That was great. I um, don't think we, we lost any any um, of the information through the transition. And that was, there was tons of information. Um, I have questions rolling in. If you have questions, um, submit them into the question and answer dialog box, and I'll read them aloud. Um, I'll go ahead and start um, with a few that I have. Um, so I'll let you, both of you, decide who's best uh, to, to answer. Um, so one person wrote, great, great job on the metrics, the idea of measuring um, which initiatives that sustain green jobs. Um, the question is, how do, you, how do you plan to measure that? Shubhita, it might be a good question for you. You want to explain the, the back-facing uh, dialogue that we have on the, um, with the metrics chart that might be useful? Sure. So we have uh, considered a series of different metrics to measure progress over time, and we have about 121, I believe, uh, that cover each of our sustainability action areas. Uh, the creation of green jobs is certainly one of the areas that we're particularly interested in and uh, the effect on uh, economic development in the area. So we will be tracking closely um, the projects that we're engaged in and the ways in which uh, green jobs are created. So, uh, you know, basically the specific metric would be the number of green jobs that are associated with projects that are related to the Climate Action Plan. Great, thanks. Uh, someone asked if you could talk a little bit more about the energy improvement districts and what, what exactly is that? Sure. So um, the energy improvement district is a form of, it's, it's essentially a political subdivision that can be created by um, state statute, I think it's section 32-80A, and it allows for towns to establish these districts to help them, them manage energy uh, generation in their in their towns. As I mentioned, we're, we're meeting for the first time today, and one of the, the towns that we're looking as a model to is Bridgeport, which had a, an energy improvement district that is sort of, uh, sort of I think, uh, maybe grown a little dormant, um, but there are other towns too. Stamford has one uh, primarily in its downtown, and Sonia, I think Weston may have developed one. So they, these have been developed in just a small number of communities around the state as a, as a way to help uh, a town manage energy generation. And what we're trying to figure out here, and what we will try to figure out in just a couple hours today, is where Hartford can use the Energy Improvement District primarily to increase resiliency of critical facilities, just like we did at the Parkville microgrid, which Shubita mentioned. Um, we, we think that the, the Energy Improvement District could be a way to, to finance, to organize, and to generate energy to critical facilities um, that would help us withstand uh, grid outages. So we're not sure, I guess the short answer is we're not sure there are other models and we're going to try to see how and what we can do here. Great, thanks. Good description there. Um, can you expand on the electric vehicle deployment? What types of things are you doing? Sure, so I can start on this and maybe Shubhita you can talk about the city fleet 
issues uh, that may have come up. But from a from an EV standpoint, one of our, our main goals in particularly in the zoning code has been to try to create a framework for electric vehicles. So it, we're, I think we may be the only city in Connecticut that does this and one of the first cities in the country. We require an electric vehicle charging station, a type one or type two, anytime there's a parking lot of 35 cars or more. So we are, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build into um, the just the basic physical infrastructure of our town, um, energy uh, 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 infrastructure for energy efficient um, vehicles. We've also proposed in this climate plan, and I'm trying to see which page it's on, um, reduced parking rates for um, for energy efficient vehicles, and we're, you know, it's something that we're in discussions with the parking authority about. We have a page here on on um, energy efficient vehicles, which kind of tells you how what we're aspiring to do. One place that we probably haven't made much progress, although we do have some Priuses in the fleet, is city is the city fleet. And Shubert, I don't know if you've had um, a chance to to dig into this issue yet, but I'll turn it over to you to, tr to see if there's anything um, of interest in that regard. Yeah, the Sustainability Office hasn't made too much progress yet on electric vehicles in the city fleet, but we are working with the Connecticut Green Bank in order to uh, offer lower cost electric vehicles to city employees. So that's an offer that was uh, recently put out there, and I believe a couple of city employees have taken advantage of it. So that's an area that, um, you know, we're still working on, I would say. Great. Um, is Hartford looking at providing a municipal composting program? Municipal, what, was it composting? Yes. Yeah. So the, the, a, a number of uh, groups here in the city have put in for um, uh, the Rathman Challenge, which would be a several hundred thousand dollars that would go towards um, developing a more robust composting program. So far we've had neighborhood pilot programs, or in the case of Building Forge, an apartment community um, pilot program, but we haven't really gone to that citywide. Um, we've enabled through zoning and have been talking with community groups about a, comp a, a larger scale composting facility that might be um, place somewhere either in DPW or area or um, the north or south meadows or maybe in one of our park areas. Um, in addition to composting, we're also having the same conversation about wood materials and the, the amount of uh, wood material debris that our parks generate um, and, our, and our private spaces, but especially our parks, really lends itself to a, a wood material debris processing facility um, that would, again, create green jobs, um, would help us figure out what to do with, uh, with fallen trees, diseased trees. Um, and so th those are two conversations that we're having, but we're not ready, I don't think, um, to, to say that we announce any grand opening of a facility at any time in the, in the near future, but it, it's something that we've put in the climate action plan as something we hope to do. Okay, um, next question. How can faith communities be helpful in communicating the climate action plan? Carrie, can you repeat the question? How can faith communities be helpful in communicating the climate action plan? I'm sorry, I guess I don't quite understand. I think so, faith, faith communities, so religious institutions is what you're you're talking yeah, about. Um, so we, right. we had we had um, on the climate action plan. We really just had one um, representative of a, of a faith uh, of a faith, religious institution, um, faith congregational church, um, p participating. And I think there's there's a parallel effort. Part of that is because there's a parallel effort that Eco Justice Religious um, Inter Religious Network and some other groups that, that have folded religious institutions in. And I, I think we haven't fully explored that yet. And as part of the implementation, and there, there's also the Solarize with Faith program, which is um, focused on statewide efforts to get faith communities to encourage their members and, and themselves as institutions to, to use uh, solar energy. But we haven't explored that yet, and that's something that is really an untapped resource because so many of the members uh, of our religious institutions 
in Hartford actually live outside of Hartford, and so that could be a, an avenue for regional effort. But if somebody has a specific idea, um, you contact Schubert or contact me, and I can we can try to figure out how to do that. And I think that's something that Schubert is planning on doing is engaging different members of the community in this effort now that it's been adopted. Great, thanks. Uh, are, uh, are you doing any of these on a regional basis with surrounding towns? I think it's referring to some of the goals. Um, are you doing any of the goals on a regional basis with surrounding towns? If the person who wrote that wants to clarify, feel free. We are not currently engaged in regional efforts, uh, with the exception of uh, working with NBC pretty closely on green infrastructure. I would say that we're taking input, advice, guidance from surrounding communities and doing a lot of knowledge sharing right now. Uh, the Sustainability Office is part of the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership Task Force, which uh, shares different ideas related to energy efficiency in municipal buildings and schools as well. So, that's one area where we've regionalized, but other than that, um, there's nothing on the horizon right now, Mustard, you'd like to fill in? Yeah, I, actually in the area of transportation, so so we work really closely with the Capital Region Council and governments on transportation um, issues, and so all of these issues about pedestrian and bike infrastructure and biking trails and connecting regionally to the East Coast Greenway, um, I think that's an area where we have had a lot of very fruit, fruitful connections in terms of um, in terms of regional partners. And actually that leads into the next question. Uh, uh, good job expanding bike lanes in Hartford. Is there a plan to provide um, a bike share program with the possibility of working with surrounding towns? So bike shares have been studied in Hartford, um, I think at, at one point a few years ago, and we've been looking at it now. What we found in, in the, there's another whole group called the Complete Streets Working Group that is, a, is a, led by Sandy Fry, many of you probably know her. Um, what, what we've kind of found is that bike share would be great for, for us, but, but the, the economics at this point don't work for the development of a new program. It costs about half a million dollars to start a bike share program. And so the question for us is, is that money better spent on a bike share program or is it better spent doing things that we know we need to do like striping um, and uh, you know, development of new trails, the planning, planning uh, and all of that, um, education, um, you know, wh where is that money best spent? And it's included as a goal within the climate action plan, but it's the kind of goal that we would love to do if we get a dedicated funding source that would, will only do bike share. If we have a, a company come in that will, will do bike share, that's not something that I think we are prepared to fund. You know, in the I don't think that's that's the city's highest priority for that kind of funding um, until we get some of the other stuff, the infrastructure that would that would encourage people to, to ride bikes here. Um, you know, squared away. And it, it's a great place for biking in some places, but, but Hartford's a busy busy city, and so, you know, we need that kind of striped infrastructure, protected bike lanes to be built up um, before I think we can have a truly successful bike share program. People actually want to pay to ride bikes here. Okay, a couple more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, how will this, do I'm going to combine a couple of questions. Um, how will this document continue to evolve with respect to citizen input, budget, and implementation schedule not included in the current draft? And how do you plan to report progress? Shubhana? Yeah, so uh, we were talking about this at the Climate Stewardship Council meeting this week, uh, just ensuring that this is a living document for us. and. Uh, having a, a you know, cycle of edits every potentially 12 to 18 months and the sustainability office will definitely be reporting on progress against our goals on a regular basis. So there is certainly an effort to ensure that um, we're updating the plan, that we're reporting um, progress in a transparent way that we're providing data to uh, members of the public. And, um, you know, I think in terms of some of the budgets and scoping of projects, that's uh, something that we're working on right now. Um, and it will be an outcome of the working group sessions that we'll be holding uh, this fall. Great. Okay, last question, if it's uh, one o'clock. Um, 
So decreasing emissions from um, vehicles is a part of your climate transportation section. So aside from passenger vehicle electrification, are you considering other alternative fuels uh, such as propane and natural gas? We're actually, um, I think we're the, the site of the first commercial hydrogen refueling station in the Northeast um, here in Hartford. So hydrogen, I, I couldn't hear if hydrogen was added to that list, but that's um, something that we've um, gotten uh, that's being either built or um, I don't know if if it's if it's final finally built or got it CFO, but it's definitely um, is something that will be located at the Pride Center along I-91. Um, but as far as you know, looking for other vehicles, we're, we're trying to participate in the VW um, settlement, but I think that's going to go primarily towards school buses and, and diesel retrofits, uh, and not. Um, clean energy, alternative energy vehicles. You know, as you probably know, the city's in a budget crisis, so I'm not sure we're buying new vehicles. But Shubhita, do you have insights on that? I actually don't, but I can, you know, I can look into it and, and let folks know for sure. Great. Uh, well, that's all the time we have for questions, and I just want to really thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to Sarah and Shubhita for your time and your commitment to, to take action on climate change from the city of Hartford. I look forward to working with you both, and uh, as you know, Deep in general does. Um, and uh, for folks who um, know that others might be interested in, in listening to the webinar, we will post a recording on our website. Um, I encourage other um, other folks to, to tune in. I know that it sounded to me like this process um, was replicable in other towns, and I hope uh, I hope it was uh, valuable for, for folks to maybe follow uh, the City of Hartford's lead. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Shubhita. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.